It's time for smart money moves. Living debt free for many people sounds like a pipe dream, but today we'll discuss ways to get out of debt and stay out of debt. That's coming up right now on Smart Money Moves. I'm Marcia Griffin, and I'd like to welcome you to Smart Money Moves, building wealth for everyday people. The average American carries a debt load of more than $90,000, according to the Experian Credit Bureau. In 2020, that included over $5,000 in credit debt, over $19,000 in auto loans, and over $39,000 in student loans. That's per person. So how can you live debt-free or at least eliminate debt? Joining us today are Reverend Dr. DeForest Soares, founder of the D-Free Financial Freedom Movement and author of Say Yes to No Debt, 12 Steps to Financial Freedom. And we'd like to welcome Wesley Watkins, the managing principal and financial advisor of the W and W Group. I'd like to welcome you both to Smart Money Moves. When we talk about debt, this is a financial issue, this is an emotional issue, this is a, a psychological issue, uh, one that really weighs down and impacts a person's life. So tell us, Reverend Soares, what prompted you to focus on this issue to help people to eliminate debt? Well, first of all, Marcia, thank you so much for having me uh, on, on your show and to be with such a distinguished guest. First, it was personal. I was living paycheck to paycheck and I was using credit cards to finance a lifestyle that I could not afford. So let me be clear at the beginning. I'm not against all debt but I learned that I had to stop using debt as though it was income. I was making $25,000 a year. I had a $5,000 credit limit on my credit card. So I, I lived as though I made $30,000. <laughs> I had to stop using credit cards and consumer debt to fund a lifestyle that I could not afford. I still use debt, but I use debt to create wealth. And those are two different times, types of debt. And I wasn't saving because when I was in debt, I was in debt again for lifestyle reasons. Some people are in debt because of, of health care costs. Some people are in debt because of divorce. Some people are in debt because of student loans. I was in debt for lifestyle reasons. And I realized that I was spending money before I earned it, which meant I couldn't save. I could not invest. I couldn't even donate to the great causes of our day. So, so debt undermined my ability to create wealth, and that's why I had to get control of my debt so that I could build the wealth that I've built. I love that honesty. We've all been in debt, at least most of us, and certainly I have been in debt uh, at some point in our lives, but it has an impact on us. Wesley, talk to us for a minute about, uh, about your work what both of you have touched on earlier in the conversation about being in debt and it even ex even beyond that or, or making mistakes in life. One of the things that I that I share with people is I love failure. Failure is a wonderful, great thing. Success is OK, but failure is great because you cannot be successful if you have not failed. That's right. It's that's just how it works. Failure is where you learn everything. Failure is a teacher. Failure are lessons. Failure helps you to develop great habits. Success is okay. Failure is where you learn everything. Absolutely, absolutely. That is such a powerful statement. And that's what we are about on this program and with our audience, to talk about real situations, real outcomes, and real solutions. Why do you think so many people are in debt? Well, again, many people are in debt for reasons 
beyond their control and they're using credit to close economic gaps. The wealth gap in this country between blacks and whites is about 10 times, meaning the median mm -hmm. wealth of black people is 10% that of the median wealth of white people. And we don't have to go into the history. We have inherited a deficit reality in our community. So let's start right there. Yeah. And that gap is often closed by spending money that's that's granted to us through the use of credit. And it's coupled with the fact that we, we, we're not taught how to use credit effectively mm -hmm. and strategically. Most of us don't talk to people like Wesley. Too many black people get their financial information from the barbershop and the beauty shop. We, we are underrepresented as it relates to talking to professionals. A guy like Wesley can help us understand what to do strategically with the money that we have. Now, we are also bombarded by marketing that's more powerful mm -hmm. than it's ever been before. This is the first time in history when you can look up a pair of shoes on your phone and every time you come back to your phone, the shoes show up, <laughs> you know? I mean, Absolutely. You yeah. your Bible and the shoes show up. <laughs> and after about four or five times, you figure the Lord wants you to buy those shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, so you're going to go and buy it, right? It's a convergence of all of those things. And that's why shows like these are important. Professionals like Wesley are important. And hopefully I do one or two important things as we try to educate people and be aware of the options and about the pitfalls. So talk to us just for a minute, and I'm going to get back to you, Wesley, in a minute. Reverend Soros, what made you decide to write the book? Now, we know that you were in debt, and I appreciate your, your level of honesty. You understand the impact that debt and uh, that debt has on many people, uh, many races and, and cultures of people, but you really have taken a lot of time to write uh, your 12 steps, uh, getting out of debt. You, you have a whole series of material. Well, I, I was the pastor of a Baptist church and 15 years into my tenure there, what I realized was that we had people in our congregation going on great vacations in the Bahamas, driving luxury cars, living in four bedroom houses with big lawns. And when mama died, they'd come to the church for the church to pay for the funeral. Or when, mm -hmm. when they had an emergency, they had to go to the deacons to get a little check for a $300 emergency. And, and when I saw that trend, I realized that my members were living today the way I used to live when I was in my 20s. And right. I, I told the leaders of the church, we're gonna make helping our people get out of debt, manage their finances and create wealth, the central priority of this ministry because as a pastor, you know, I depended on people giving 10% of their income to the church. Mm -hmm. But as a responsible pastor, my job was to make sure they knew how to deal with the 90% that, that was left. So it was a pastoral response to the realities of the members of my church. And then the broader community had statistics that revealed that we couldn't limit this to the four walls of the church. It was really something that we had to take to black America. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't tell me people in church are broke. <laughs> Listen, preachers are broke. I was broke. When I first started preaching, Marcia, I traded in a paid for Chevy to borrow money to buy a Cadillac that I couldn't afford because I thought preachers drove Cadillacs. <laughs> so yes. so yes. I was I was broke. I tell a young folk that my young activist friends today, I was woke and broke. <laughs> <laughs> Walk and broke. Look, I tell you, that's a testament. And look, that's why we are here today to really focus on how to better handle our money and how to be smart about our money. Wesley, I'd love to also get your thoughts on why so many people are in debt. What are you finding? That the Reverend touched on a lot of different things. Um, we live in an information age, which is good and bad. The, the plus side of that is that access to information is easy, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The bad side is access into, into information is easy, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right. And 
we also live in a technology world. You know, technology runs everything. So one of the things that the Reverend touched on is that they monitor everything that you do. These these companies and and you know I don't want to get into naming all the different companies, but they monitor everything. So one of the things that I explain to people is when you go to the supermarket, as an example, and they have a card or whatever, you can swipe something and get 10% off or this, that, or the other. They're not doing that just for the sake of doing it. It's a way for them to monitor your spending habits within that store. And then what that puts them in a good position to do is to market to you based on your spending habits, which is which is very effective. I know even for me, look, I have been in debt. There's no question about it. I thought a credit card was just my a lifestyle, uh, a lifestyle expenditure for me. I could go out and just buy whatever I want until that bill came in. That was that was a wake up call. And more and more bills come in. You then see the light. But, you know, the, the reality, guys, is this. For a lot of women in particular, and I'll use myself as an example. I mean, there is just a positive feeling. I guess it's the dopamine or whatever you get in your brain when you just buy a little bit of something. So how do we get over the, the, the kind of psychological need or desire to, to spend because it feels good? Even buying something small tends to feel good for some of us that, and we know we, that needs to be corrected. So what do you all suggest? Um, in terms of overcoming this kind of desire, personal desire and feeling about, about buying something and spending, because that's what really causes a lot of the problems that, that we have. What do you all think? If you put your finger on it, in my book, mm -hmm. in the very first chapter, I talk about admitting the problem. And the problem is precisely that the marketers that Wesley talked about are aiming at our feelings. Advertisements mm -hmm. aren't trying to convince us that the product is good, but they what they do, and, and psychologists have the last sign off on commercials. They're trying to tap into our feeling so that we'll feel better driving a BMW, mm -hmm. even if we can only afford a Toyota. Or That's we right. Feel better um, wearing certain clothes with certain designer labels on it. So in my book, I talk about three types of spending. One is compensatory spending. We call it retail therapy sometimes, where we shop, we spend money to compensate for the feelings that we're not getting from someplace else. And so we call that um, uh, shopping or spending for significance. Then there's yes. conspicuous consumption where we, sh we spend for status. You know, I, I had mm -hmm. I, I was addicted to a picture of a man on a horse holding a stick at one point in my life. And then I realized I've never been to a polo game in my life. Why is that logo <laughs> important to me? So it was a status. Absolutely. Thing. And then the third type of spending is confused spending, which is just stupid. And we just spend money without analyzing what we're doing. So if we can start getting a good feeling, Wesley talked about intangibles. I get a good feeling when I look at my bank balance, when I look mm -hmm. at my real estate value. I get the same feeling I used to get from buying ties that I couldn't afford, I get that fit when my stock goes up, when yep. my 403B increases in value, when my credit score is over 800. I yeah. now, I've, so you have to transfer feelings because you'll always have feelings. But what I felt about those shiny objects, I now feel about those intangible assets. Oh, that is so powerful. That is so powerful. You are not kidding. It's all about how we feel and that feeling kind of moves us in the direction and so you you know the the kind of advice that you all are giving today and all of our guests on smart money move the the, the objective here is to really be more focused on our money our finances as both uh reverend sara said and wesley said look everybody's trying to get it Everybody is trying to get your money, and what are you going to do? How much of it will you keep? So I have a, a couple of questions for both of you, and I'll start with you, Wesley. What three ways would you suggest that a person get out of debt? We Look, we know that it exists. 
People want easy ways to get out of debt and hopefully they'll stay out of debt and really get some, some more information about how to move their lives forward in a good financial way. What would you suggest? I, and as opposed to giving like step one, step two, step three, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, a, a broader stroke answer that I think would, would, would make it, e well, I don't know if easy is the word, but um, something that people could follow. Yes. Uh, if I had to sum it up, why people are in debt, it's because the habits that they've that they've developed for for all these external reasons that we've said. And to get out of debt, we have to change those. Habits. Right with your left hand, if you're right handed, it's not that you can't do it. It's that the difference oftentimes between your dominant and your less dominant hand is is practice. We yes. both can, most people can write with both hands. One is better than the other because you practice with one more than the other. So we have to learn how to do that practice, which is not easy. It's, it's, it's the going to the gym and, you know, we all want to lose weight and be in phenomenal shape, but nobody wants to sweat or put in the work. And right. it just, it, do, it doesn't work that way. So one day, one step. So one of the things I would say is, I would never tell people not to uh, acquire things that either make them feel good, that they like, or, or, or things along those lines. But here's, the, here's the, the caveat I would put with it. If you can spend $500 on a purse and $500 on a purse, you should be able to put away at least $300 for you. I really want to say whatever you spend dollar for dollar, you should put that away. But I'm going to give a little wiggle room in there. If you can spend $500 on a purse, you should be able to put $300 away for you. And if you can't do both, then you shouldn't do either one. Well, let me, that's not true. You should still put the money away, but you have to put in some levels of uh, safeguards or, or, or parameters that, that, because we can justify anything that we want. We can, you know, we want this, we want that. We can justify it. But when it comes yes. to accumulating, saving, uh, 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 building a legacy, then we, then we come up with excuses. So whatever it is that your thing is, and we all have a thing, I would say whatever the value of that thing is, you should be able to put away at least 50% of that value for you. And you should be able to do both simultaneously. If you cannot do that, then you shouldn't acquire most likely what, what is a depreciable asset, which I don't know how much time we have, but we can get into, maybe we can get into that. <laughs> on another show, we may have to get into that on another show, but look, you're, you're bringing up some really excellent points. Reverend Soares, I, I just want to get your, your, your thoughts. You've written a lot about this. Tell us very quickly, what are three ways in your opinion that uh, people can begin. Look, I, I can't say eliminate all debt. We want you to just limit and, and at least be focused on the debt uh, so that you can just do better financially. What are you suggesting, Reverend Soros? Okay, three things. One, you have to decide that it's a priority because every dollar of debt that you pay off is a dollar of wealth that you're creating. Mm -hmm. Number right. two, you have to separate your wants from your needs. We teach people to do that because you have to focus on your wants, but the money you spend on your wants as opposed to your needs, it takes away from the kind of wealth building that Wesley talked about. And then the third is once you identify your, your needs versus your wants, you build a spending plan, otherwise known as a budget, because the only way you can do what we teach. We teach living on 70% of your income, 10% to God, 10% to yourself, 10% to your future. And the only way you can do that is you have to have a budget that has priorities based on your, your, your needs more than your wants. Absolutely, absolutely. These uh, comments from both of you have been excellent and hopefully uh, your your comments and your your suggestions uh, will will convince many people in our audience to really look at things a little bit differently. To close, I do want both of you to tell us 
two things that you think our viewers should remember, two things that you want our viewers to leave with. Reverend Soros, why don't you start? Okay, thing number one, I want everyone to Google blacks in 2053. Just type that in Google. And what will come up is that by the year 2053, many experts believe the median net worth for black people will be zero. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the only people that can change that is us, one family at a time. That's number one. Number Great. two, there is help available. Whether you're drowning in debt or whether you're making a million dollars a year, you need the advice of an expert. You need a professional. The people who do your hair are licensed. The people who, drive, right. who fly airplanes are licensed. You need to talk to a licensed professional like Wesley, no matter what your income or what your status is. And if you have one, you need a second opinion. Licensed, but we have to start getting financial advice from professionals and not from barbershops. <laughs> and not from barbershops. Okay, Wesley, what would you say? What are two things you would love our viewers to remember? Two things that I would like the viewers to remember is a lot of information is free. Um, we Google a lot of things. Begin to educate yourself. Of, of course, talk to professionals such as myself and other uh, people that deal with money in terms of moves that you can make. It only takes 83 cents a day, which is $25 a month, to have a formal investment program. And for those people, because the first obstacle people say is, I don't have any money to invest. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't make enough money. And that's one of the myths. You need all of this money. Yes, we would love for all of our clients to have millions and millions of dollars, but that's just not the reality. Right. So 83 cents a day, $25 a month. And I share with people, if you can't scrape together some way, somehow, and put 83 cents a day away, you should either quit your job or get another one. <laughs> Uh, educate yourself and leave Absolutely. leave an inheritance an inheritance inheritance what these things that we've talked about and the reverend touched on the three things god putting money away for god yourself and your future and those three things should be done first it should be bigger than you when you're putting money away for yourself and your future it should be bigger than you that's how you create the legacy it should be it, your money should survive you. Your right. wealth should survive you. It shouldn't stop when you shut your eyes. Yeah. And Absolutely. GoFundMe is not an insurance company. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. Absolutely. <laughs> well, look, I tell you, we could talk about this all day and we certainly want all of you in our uh, in our audience, our, our viewers to have a great life, have a legacy, a legacy as, uh, as Wesley mentioned, and really live a life that you're really comfortable in and don't have the worries of debt hanging over your head. As we close, I'd love to thank my guests for the discussion today and a big, big thank, thanks to you, our audience, for joining me. For more information on this program or any other program produced by WHUT, go to WHUT.org, O-R-G. Remember, together we can make a difference in our communities, in our lives, and within ourselves. See you next time on Smart Money Moves.
This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.